First, uh, I'd like to extend uh, my um, great appreciation and the honor it is uh, to be a part of uh, this uh, conference. Um, it's always a joy to be invited uh, to do virtually anything by Ted Shaw and Jack Boger. Uh, so thanks so much for having me. Um, I uh, am very eager and excited about uh, the, the panel we have here and the topic we're endeavoring uh, to, um, to engage with the legal challenge that yielded Brown v. Board of Education and Brown's evolution during the succeeding 20 years. So we've got a time frame of 1954 uh, to 1975. Uh, but, I, but I do want to pause. Um, I am first also I want to say what a great honor it is uh, to be able to um, share uh, this time and he hear from uh, two very preeminent scholars um, in the field. Um, but um, I also um, was uh, told when uh, the in invitation was passed along uh, that um, I could have a bit of um, moderator's privilege and I debated about um, how I would use it, but I think I'm gonna use it right now um, to first say um, how incredible it is uh, to follow, um, even though we aren't in person, um, Eric Foner. Um, and, it's a, and it's a good way for me to introduce this panel um, and, um, and also connect uh, not just personally to um, what Professor Foner just shared, but to the topic uh, for this panel. And then um, after I'm done with that, uh, the agenda will be, we're gonna hear from uh, both uh, Professor Klarman and Professor Stone. Uh, and um, after that, um, have um, a little bit of uh, back and forth amongst us with some questions. And then most definitely uh, leave time uh, for uh, those of us, uh, those of you who are listening uh, to ask questions as well. So I really look forward to that. That. Um, but as far as uh, personal privilege, um, I um, want to follow along in what has been um, a great morning of people engaging with um, how today's topic uh, relates to them personally. Um, and um, I was uh, heartened to hear that from both um, Professor Omar and uh, Dean Chemerinsky. Um, and so uh, the ways this uh, topic uh, connects with me personally, um, I actually want to start because of how uh, significant I think uh, Professor Foner is um, in helping us with uh, what is the um, overarching inquiry, as I understand it, for our exercise in these two days, is uh, this question of what's the path forward with respect to the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and I find it uh, very uh, significant that Professor uh, Foner has um, offered us um, a path forward that is through history, uh, and a path forward that is through history um, in a way uh, that directly engages with the question of how we find meaning uh, in the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and, um, and I think there's also a way forward uh, through uh, Brown itself. Um, I um, took the, the, the time to, to reread it um, for the umpteenth time right before uh, we, we, we started this morning. Um, and um, I would say that there's also, um, as I think Professor Fauner and others have pointed out, including Professor Amar, uh, there's an intellectual way forward, I think, through the Supreme Court's early precedents um, in its interpretation in the slaughterhouse cases. Uh, and, um, and even going back, I've also revisited uh, just recently uh, Charles Black's essay um, in the Yale Law Review. Um, and the simplicity of his arguments uh, is, is also, I think, a potential um, intellectual way forward. Uh, but what is uh, personal for me um, is that uh, I am um, both um, a native of North Carolina. Uh, so um, I, there, there are ways in which I regret not being able to be home in my home state uh, to have this opportunity. Um, but I'm also, as far as how I connect to this material um, as a human being, um, I'm the descendant of not just enslaved African-Americans, I'm the, the descendant of African-Americans who were free. And then I'm also the descendant of slavers. Uh, and with that, uh, the opportunity to connect to and uh, think about the implications of what Eric Foner has said about uh, the Dunning School and the view of the Reconstruction era and having been um, a public school student in North Carolina um, that um, not just learned that history, uh, but um, can very palpably recollect the shame and humiliation that history had on me as a student. Uh, I think it is um, really a, a, 
instrumental and critical aspect to what we think about as we move forward. Uh, so again, I want to really thank uh, the UNC Center uh, for bringing all of these um, amazing individuals together. And so with that, I want to shift to uh, the, the, the two decades we're looking at this morning. Um, and so I will again uh, do that shift uh, with a personal connection. Um, there was a uh, talk this morning again from Dean Chemerinsky about um, accidents of history uh, and uh, much of our Supreme Court precedent is that. Um, but I'd also say that um, I am here as um, um, I think an anomaly of history and an anomaly of history, which I look forward to Professor Klarman and Professor Stone um, giving their, um, their, their scholarly uh, connections to because uh, within our time period, uh, the time period of this panel. We have Brown, we have Brown II, we have massive resistance, we have the Supreme Court's um, inaction um, in uh, implementing Brown, but then we also have uh, the important cases of Green, Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg. And as Nietzsche Marinsky uh, mentioned this morning, um, outside of our time frame, uh, we have uh, Dowell and M Milliken. Uh, and so I am an individual as a public school student uh, from North Carolina who was really able to get through uh, that very, um, we now see it was a closing crack um, in this door of opportunity uh, that Green and Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg opened up. Uh, and so uh, these um, intellectual terms, these phrases uh, like that refer to uh, resegregation, uh, it's a function of um, something that happened after me, and then uh, Brown and Brown too, uh, being cases that um, if it had not been for them, I wouldn't be here now. Um, and so, um, so what we're about to uh, get some insights from and what I've really been looking forward to is uh, first Professor Klarman uh, is going to uh, speak for about 15 minutes and then Professor Stone is gonna speak for about uh, 15 minutes as well. Um, I think I'm gonna see if I can slip in a couple of questions to uh, Professor Klarman first uh, and then Professor Stone, but we'll see how, how, how things are going uh, because I think what I, um, might work as well is for them to both just go one after the other um, and we'll, we'll talk after. So, um, so with that, um, I will um, shift to Professor Klarman and uh, look forward to um, getting questions from you um, as those who are listening uh, when we're all done. Uh, greetings, everybody. Greetings from Maine where it's even colder uh, than, when you, than where you are unless you happen to be in Texas without heat in which case you have my deepest sympathies that you were unable to join Senator Cruz in Cancun. I'm gonna try in my introductory remarks to tell you a few things you may not already know about Brown. I'm trying to fit a lot into 15 minutes, so this may go pretty quickly, with apologies to anyone who's trying to take notes. First of all, Brown was actually a hard case for the justices. We tend to assume otherwise today. This case seems easy, and after all, the decision was unanimous but the justices were intensely divided when the case was first argued. A memo written by Justice Douglas the day of the decision observed that had a vote been taken after the initial argument in December, 1952, it would have been quote, five to four in favor of the constitutionality of segregation in the public schools. Second point, why was the case so hard for the justices? I think because it posed a conflict between what they perceived the traditional legal sources to indicate and their personal values. Most of the justices thought racial segregation was a grotesque evil. It was quote unquote, Hitler's creed as Justice Black put it at one point. For example, in a letter to a friend, Justice Jackson who had left the court for a year to prosecute Nazis at Nuremberg wrote quote, you and I have seen the terrible consequences of racial hatred in Germany. We can have no sympathy with racial conceits which underlie segregation policies, close quote. The same was true of Justice Frankfurter, who was an Austrian Jew who lost family in the Holocaust, had been an advisor to the NAACP in the 1930s, and had hired the court's first black law clerk, William Coleman, in 1947. Justices such as Frankfurter and Jackson believed deeply in the separation of law and a justice's moral views. In a memo he wrote while Brown was pending, Frankfurter insisted that his personal views on segregation were of limited relevance to the constitutional question. Quote, however passionately any of us may hold egalitarian views, however fiercely any of us may believe that such a policy of segregation as undoubtedly expresses the tenacious conviction of Southern states, 
is both unjust and short-sighted. He travels outside his judicial authority, and for this private reason alone, he declares unconstitutional the policy of segregation, close quote. The court could invalidate segregation, these justices believe, only if it was legally as well as morally objectionable. But the justices had difficulty finding a legal argument for striking down segregation that convinced them. Jackson wrote in a draft concurring opinion that he never published, quote, layman as well as lawyer must query how it is that the constitution this morning forbids what for three quarters of a century it has tolerated or approved. Can we honestly say that the states which have maintained segregated schools have not until today been justified in understanding their practice to be constitutional, close quote. Frankfurter's law clerk, Alexander Bickel, spent a summer reading the legislative history of the 14th Amendment, and he reported to Frankfurter that it was impossible to conclude that the 39th Congress had intended that segregation be abolished or foresaw that it would be under the amendment. Jackson concluded in his <clears throat> opinion, quote, it is hard to find an indication that any influential body of the movement that carried the Civil War amendments had reached the point of thinking about either segregation or education of the Negro as a current problem, and harder still to find that the amendments were designed to be a solution, close quote. These justices were not doctrinaire originalists. They believed that the meaning of constitutional, concept, constitutional concepts could change over time. But that did not mean that judges were free to simply write their own moral views into the Constitution. In the early 1950s, more than 20 states still segregated their schools. Thus, one could hardly maintain that evolving social standards condemn the practice. Precedent strongly supported segregation. Of 44 challenges to school segregation adjudicated by state appellate courts and lower federal courts between 1865 and 1935, not a single one had succeeded. As Jackson noted, quote, almost a century of decisional law rendered by judges, many of whom risked their lives for the cause that produced these amendments, is almost unanimous in the view that the amendment tolerated segregation by state action, close quote. Unable to justify the abolition of segregation as a judicial act, Jackson agreed to, quote, go along with it as a political decision, close quote. Third, why were the justices able to come out as they did in Brown, notwithstanding their legal doubts? The answer is that the dramatic shift in racial attitudes and practices during and after World War II led them to conclude that racial segregation was an egregious moral wrong. All judicial decision-making, I believe, involves both legal and extra-legal or political considerations, with the latter including factors such as the personal values of judges, existing social mores and external political pressure on the court. But when the law, as reflected in factors such as text, original understanding, precedent, and custom is clear, judges will generally follow it. And in 1954, the law, as understood by most of the justices, was reasonably clear. Segregation was constitutionally permissible. For the justices to reject a result so clearly indicated by the conventional legal sources suggests that they had very strong personal preferences to the contrary. And by the early 1950s, so they did. World War II had been fought with an anti-fascist ideology, a rejection of theories of white Aryan supremacy, which forced many Americans to think, rethink their views about the South's Jim Crow system. The war also heightened the racial, racial militancy of black soldiers who calculated that if they were good enough to risk their lives fighting for democracy abroad, they ought to be good enough to enjoy some of it at home. Many of these soldiers became the vanguard of the domestic civil rights movement. The Cold War imperative for racial justice that followed the war impelled Americans to try to put their racial house in order in order to counteract Soviet propaganda that capitalized on American racial injustices and tragedies in an effort to persuade largely non-white developing nations that democratic capitalism was synonymous with white supremacy. In addition, the great migration of African Americans from the rural South to the urban North, which had begun during World War I, accelerated during World War II, pushing another couple of million African Americans into Northern industrial states, where they increasingly held the balance of power between the two political parties, which competed for their votes with progressive civil rights policies. These various forces were starting to have a concrete effect on racial practices by the late 1940s. 
Jackie Robinson desegregated Major League Baseball in 1947. President Truman issued executive orders desegregating the federal military and federal civil service in 1948. Black voter registration in the South grew from 3% in 1940 to 20% in 1950, and dozens of urban police forces in the South hired their first Black officers since Reconstruction. Minor League Baseball teams, even in the Deep South, had signed their first Black players. The justices were aware of these developments generally, if not specifically. For example, Frankfurter noted, quote, the great changes in the relations between white and colored people since the First World War, close quote. And he remarked that, quote, the pace of progress has surprised even those most eager in its promotion, close quote. Justice Jackson went even further, quote, Negro progress under segregation has been spectacular and tested by the pace of history. His rise is one of the swiftest and most dramatic advances in the annals of man, close quote. Such changes in racial attitudes and practices made Brown possible. Frankfurter later noted that he would have voted to uphold segregation had such a case reached the court in the 1940s because, quote, public opinion had not been crystallized against it, close quote. The justices didn't think they were creating a movement for racial reform in Brown. They understood they were working with, not against, deep historical forces. Fourth and lastly, let me talk briefly about one way that Brown helped pave the way for the landmark civil rights legislation of the 1960s. The traditional view is probably that Brown educated and motivated African Americans to challenge Jim Crow. There's certainly something to that view, but Brown also crystallized the resistance of Southern whites to racial change, radicalized Southern politics as office seekers competed against one another to become the most extreme opponent of desegregation and increased the likelihood that direct action protest once it developed would incite a violent response. Brown may have directly fostered white vigilante violence against blacks. Polls reveal that 15 to 50, 15 to 25 percent of Southern whites said to pollsters that they favored violence if necessary to resist desegregation. Most Southern politicians avoided explicit exhortations to violence, but the extremist rhetoric they used to condemn Brown almost certainly encouraged that violence. A speech by Congressman James Davis of Georgia was typical. He insisted that, quote, there is no place for violence or lawless activity, close quote, but only after he had called Brown, quote, a monumental fraud, which is shocking, outrageous, and reprehensible, close quote, and warned against, quote, meekly accepting this brazen usurpation of power, close quote. It's hard to miss the parallels to another racist demagogue who recently incited a violent attack upon our capital. Virtually every year after Brown, school desegregation resulted in violence somewhere in the South, violent confrontations that tended to reveal African-Americans at their best and whites at their worst. The few Blacks who had been handpicked as desegregation pioneers were almost always bright, well-mannered, and nonviolent. The mobs that sought to exclude them from white schools tended to be lower class, vicious, and obscene. Media coverage of these confrontations showed, according to one newspaper editorial, quote, quiet, resolute Negro children defying cheers and violence and sadism, close quote. To the extent that Americans form their views on school desegregation and Jim Crow from watching televised scenes of mob violence from Little Rock or New Orleans, Southern whites were doomed to lose the battle for public opinion. There's a compelling linkage between particular public officials who benefited from the post-Brown political backlash in the South and the brutality that inspired civil rights legislation. For example, Bull Connor, Birmingham's longtime commissioner of public safety, had been run out of politics in the city in the early 1950s by local business and civic leaders, leading to some moderate racial pro progress in Birmingham. After Brown, however, the city's racial progress ground to a halt and Connor resurrected his political career. In 1957, he regained his seat on the city commission by defeating an incumbent he attacked as weak on segregation. Standing for re-election in 1961, Connor cultivated extremists by offering the KKK 15 minutes of open season on the Freedom Riders as they rolled into town. 
Birmingham voters rewarded him with a landslide victory at the polls. In 1963, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, looking to conduct demonstrations in a city with a police chief who was likely to use violence, selected Birmingham partly because of Connor's presence there. The strategy worked brilliantly as Connor unleashed police dogs and fire hoses against demonstrators, many of whom were children. Newspaper editorials condemned the violence as a national disgrace and citizens voiced their outrage and demanded legislative action to curb such savagery. The Birmingham demonstrations dramatically altered Northern opinion on race and enabled passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. George Wallace personified the post-Brown racial fanaticism of Southern politics. Early in his post-war political career, Wallace had been criticized as soft on segregation, but soon after Brown, he felt the shifting political winds and became a diehard segregationist. In the 1958 gubernatorial race, Wallace criticized his principal opponent for not repudiating an endorsement by the Ku Klux Klan, thus unwittingly making himself the candidate of moderation. Wallace was handily defeated, leaving him to ruminate that he would never be out-segged again. Wallace made good on that promise in 1962, winning the governorship on a promise of standing in the schoolhouse door to defy integration orders. In June 1963, he fulfilled that pledge by physically blocking the admission of Blacks to the University of Alabama. In September, he used state troops to block school desegregation in several cities. Threatened with contempt citations from district judges in the state, Wallace relented. The schools desegregated, but within a week, Birmingham Klansmen had dynamited the 16th Street Baptist Church, killing four black schoolgirls. Most of the nation was appalled by the murder of innocent children, and Wallace received much of the blame. Tens of thousands of Americans participated in memorial services and marches to protest the bombing. Northern congressmen reflecting the anger of their constituents introduced amendments to strengthen the administration's pending civil rights bill. I'm almost done. Early in 1965, the Southern Leadership Conference brought its uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference brought its voter registration campaign to Selma, Alabama, a site chosen partly because of the presence there of a law enforcement officer of Bull Connor-like proclivities. The result was another resounding success, albeit a tragic one. <laughs> Sheriff Jim Clark's brutalization of non-resisting demonstrators culminated in Bloody Sunday, March 7th, 1965, when law enforcement officers viciously assaulted marchers, including John Lewis, as they crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge on the way to Montgomery. That evening, television networks broadcast lengthy film reports of peaceful demonstrators being assailed by stampeding horses, flailing clubs, and tear gas. Most of the nation was repulsed. Citizens demanded remedial action from their congressional representatives, scores of whom endorsed, uh, endorsed voting rights legislation while condemning the violence. President Johnson then endorsed that legislation before a joint session of Congress one week later, telling the nation that we shall overcome. To sum up, Brown radicalized the white South and brought to the surface the violence that lay at the core of white supremacy. The beating of peaceful black demonstrators by Southern white law enforcement officers repulsed national opinion and led directly to the passage of landmark civil rights legislation. Brown may have been less directly responsible than is commonly supposed for putting those demonstrators on the street, but was more directly responsible for the violent reception they encountered. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Klarman. I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Stone now. Thank you. That was terrific, Mike. I, I, you, you did a great job of uh, telling that story. Um, so what I want to do in my talk uh, is to discuss briefly what happened on the issue of school segregation in the years after the court's decision in Brown, some of which Mike has already touched upon. Um, and I should say at the outset that I am a big fan of the Warren Court. Indeed, my colleague David Strauss and I published a book just last year uh, marking the 50th anniversary of the end of the Warren Court, titled Democracy and Equality, the Enduring Constitutional Vision of the Warren Court. Now, our central thesis was not that the Warren Court was perfect, surely it wasn't, but our thesis was that the Warren Court had a proper understanding and vision of the role of the Supreme Court in American democracy, which is that it is most central for the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary 
to interpret and to apply the Constitution with an eye towards correcting the most serious weaknesses of a democracy, and our democracy in particular. That is, first, the tendency of the majority to disregard the rights and interests of the other, whether they be African Americans, immigrants, or persons accused of crime, and the tendency of the majority to manipulate the electoral and political process so as to ensure that they, that is the majority at that given moment, return, retain their political dominance. It was these issues that most drove the vision of the Warren Court in such decisions as Brown, Engels v. Vitale involving school prayer, Reynolds v. Sims involving one person and one vote, and Miranda v. Arizona involving fairness in the criminal justice system, to cite just a few of many possible examples. Now, although the Warren Court was imperfect in many ways, um, and as David and I note in our book, the justices of the Warren Court were, of course, the product of the times in which they lived, and therefore had many of the weaknesses and blind spots of their contemporaries. It's also the case that they made extraordinary progress in a range of important decisions that significantly improved our nation to this day. Let me turn now, though, to the reactions to Brown and to the challenges faced by the judiciary and by the nation in the years after the decision. As Chief Justice Warren, speaking for a unanimous court in Brown, declared, quote, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. With those words, Warren arguably hoped to sound the death knell for legal segregation of the public schools in the United States. Now, I don't know whether Warren actually believed that it would be that simple. As an experienced politician, it's difficult to think that he would have been so naive. And in fact, the reactions to Brown, as you've already heard, were furious. So furious, especially in those states in which racial segregation was the norm, that whatever hopes Warren and his brethren might have had for a revolutionary response to the decision was soon dashed. At the time of Brown, 17 southern and border states, plus the District of Columbia, maintained segregated schools by law, and four states outside the region allowed segregation by local school boards if they chose to do so. When Brown was decided, the NAACP was euphoric. Thurgood Marshall, the chief litigator for the plaintiffs, declared that if the decision was violated anywhere, by the next morning, quote, we'll have the responsible authorities in court. He predicted that as a result of Brown and the persistence of the NAACP, segregation in all of its forms would be eliminated from the nation by 1963, the hundredth anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Things didn't turn out so well. As the justices had surely anticipated, Brown met with furious opposition. Nearly 100 members of Congress, including 19 senators, all from states of the former Confederacy, signed a document that came to be known as the Southern Manifesto. It declared that Brown substituted naked power for established law and was a clear abuse of judicial authority. Most state and local politicians in the South announced that they would never accept integration and state and local school boards devised ways to evade Brown. Not surprisingly, there was not much desegregation. A decade after Brown, only a handful of previously segregated schools had been integrated. A year after Brown, the court decided Brown II, in which the court, in another unanimous decision, addressed the question of compliance with Brown. Recognizing the already furious response to the decision, the court made clear that desegregation did not need to take place immediately, but, quote, with all deliberate speed. Over the course of the next decade, the court decided three cases involving the enforcement of Brown in the context of public schools. In Cooper v. Aaron decided in 1958, the court faced a crisis in Little Rock, Arkansas. In light of Brown, the Little Rock School Board initiated a plan to desegregate its schools. All other school districts in the state refused to comply with Brown, and the Arkansas legislature amended its state constitution to prohibit desegregated schools. Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus vigorously opposed desegregation, and there were constant threats of violence to the black students who had the courage to defy the segregationists. In 
At this point, the school board suspended its plan to desegregate. The case came to the Supreme Court, and in a bold opinion signed by all nine justices individually, the court held that, quote, the constitutional rights of black students are not to be sacrificed or yielded to the violence and disorder that was occurring. Cooper v. Aaron was an unswerving affirmation by the court that desegregation was the law and must be implemented. In the court's other two decisions in the decade after Brown, Gosby Board of Education of Knoxville in 1963 and Griffin v. Prince Edward County in 1964, the justices again ruled unanimously that desegregation was essential. But except for those three decisions, the court basically took a back seat. It either refused to hear or summarily decided cases dealing with the issue. And despite those three opinions, what was happening in the states over the next decade was largely a disaster, especially in the states of the Deep South. In the six border states and the District of Columbia, Brown had an important impact as the number of African-American students attending integrated schools increased to 55%. In the states of the South though, the situation was quite different. 10 years after Brown, only 1% of all African-American students in the South were attending school with white students. And excluding Texas and Tennessee, which were a bit more reformist, the number was less than one half of 1%, or only one in 200. A number of factors contributed to this failure. Most obviously, white citizens and government officials in these states were furiously and often violently opposed the integration of the schools. Not only did they physically threaten black students who had the courage to seek to enter previously all white schools, but they often threatened their families and their lawyers. Organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and the white citizens councils were openly aggressive in their threats of physical violence. They were so effective in their intimidation that as late as 1961, not a single desegregation suit in the area of education had even been filed in Mississippi. Moreover, threats of violence were often lodged not only against plaintiffs and their lawyers, but also against judges. Most Southern state court judges did not need threats in order to be hostile to such litigation because most of them were already personally and often unalterably opposed to school integration. Chief Judge J. Edwin Livingston of the Alabama Supreme Court, for example, gave a speech in 1959 in which he openly declared I'm for segregation in every phase of life, and I don't care who knows it. I would close every school from the highest to the lowest before I would go to school with colored people. Moreover, those few judges, including federal judges, who were open to such litigation and supporting it, regularly found themselves and their families threatened. The District of Columbia Court of Appeals judge, for whom I clerked in 1971, J. Skelly Wright, had been a federal district court judge in Louisiana during this era. Because he was determined to make progress in school integration, he and his family were regularly threatened with burning crosses and worse. And he finally sent his wife and children to live in DC in order to hopefully secure their safety. When John Kennedy was elected president, Louisiana senators demanded that he appoint Judge Wright to the DC circuit, not to promote him, but as they put it, to get them the hell out of the South. Southern political leaders at both the state and local levels were fiercely opposed to school integration. Throughout the South, they called for defiance of court orders. Governor George Wallace, for example, publicly proclaimed, quote, I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And state legislatures throughout the South passed an endless variety of pro-segregation laws. As the Southern saying went, as long as we can legislate, we can segregate. Virginia closed any school subject to a desegregation order, and it even went so far as to build private segregated schools. Louisiana passed a law denying graduation to any student who attended a desegregated school. Mississippi made it illegal to attend a desegregated school. Now, of course, these laws were unconstitutional, but in light of the circumstances I described earlier, who is going to bring suits challenging them? And what judges would have the courage to rule in their favor? On top of all this, President Eisenhower during these years was largely silent on the issue of school desegregation. And even President Kennedy 
although supportive generally of civil rights, took little concrete action to support school desegregation until violence erupted, as described by Mike Klarman, in Birmingham in 1963. <clears throat> as a result of all this, to repeat myself, by 1964, a decade after Brown, only 1% of black school children were attending integrated schools in the South. What could the Warren Court have done about this state of affairs? Frankly, it's not clear. Indeed, not only was the court being demonized for its decision of Brown, but of course it was being demonized nationally for its liberal decisions on a broad range of issues, ranging from school prayer to the rights of criminal defendants to one person, one vote, and so on. And impeach Earl Warren billboards were everywhere, not only in the South. What finally changed things was Congress's passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII of which prohibited discrimination on the basis of race in any program receiving federal financial assistance. This suddenly gave a huge incentive for Southern schools, which were receiving large federal subsidies to conform reluctantly to the law. And it gave federal judges for the first time an effective tool to enforce segregation. From 1964 to 1973, federal funding for eligible Southern schools increased from 267 million per year to more than 1.4 billion annually. State legislatures simply could not forego this support. As a result from 1964 to 1973, the percentage of black school children attending school with whites in the Southern states increased from 1% to more than 90%. What's clear historically is that although the Supreme Court clearly was not able to achieve this on its own, none of this would have happened if the Supreme Court in Brown had not passionately and unanimously condemned racial segregation of public schools as a fundamental violation of our constitution. Was there more the court could have done to compel compliance with this decision of Brown? Frankly, given the circumstances in the South and the depth of the anger, I rather doubt realistically that there was all that much the court could have done without the active and aggressive support of federal authorities. It's interesting to note though, that Brown was not the only Supreme Court decision that has dramatically upset the American people over the years. Consider for example, such decisions as Loving v. Virginia, which recognized the constitutional right to interracial marriage, or Roe v. Wade, which recognized a right to abortion, or Burgerfell v. Hodges, which recognized the constitutional right to same-sex marriage. These were all highly controversial decisions, but they all, with but a few exceptions, won the day in terms of the ability of individuals to exercise their rights fairly quickly. Now, of course, the future of Roe v. Wade remains uncertain given the current makeup of the court and state laws have become ever more aggressive in their effort to prevent women from exercising this right. Roe, in this sense, although it took half a century, may be the closest analogy to Brown in terms of opposition to the decision, but it played out in very different ways over a much longer period of time and without quite the same degree of violence. One interesting question is why people in the South were so vehemently opposed to school desegregation. In the grand scheme of things, what was the big deal? Well, by coincidence, my wife, Jane Daly, who is a history professor at the University of Chicago, just published a wonderful book titled White Fright, The Sexual Panic at the Heart of America's Racist History. And it offers an intriguing answer to that question. Not a surprising answer, but a powerful one. Basically, the reason for segregation and the reason for passion about segregation, and especially in the schools, had a lot to do with the fear of the loss of white supremacy. If blacks and whites could sit together on buses, and more importantly, if children who were black and white could sit together in a classroom, they would get to know each other as real people. And they would ultimately come to see each other as partners. And ultimately they would be married and have children and destroy the whole principle of white supremacy. And it was this fear, I think, that so vehemently motivated those in the South to engage in the kind of horrid violence that they did in response to Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Those were both um, wonderful uh, 
opportunities for us to get um, a lens into uh, this historical period. Uh, and I um, feel like I personally have a, a sense of uh, the, maybe part of the answer that um, to the question I'm going to ask, but I want to go back to uh, Professor Klarman and give you an opportunity uh, to um, engage uh, a question you have, have written about quite a bit, um, which is uh, to what extent uh, the massive resistance that followed uh, Brown 1 and Brown 2 um, is a, a function or is inevitable given uh, the, um, the lack of capacity as uh, the, of the federal courts or the Supreme Court in particular uh, to combat uh, the, the, what is at the core uh, of, of white supremacy as an ideology um, and some of the things that Professor Stone mentioned. Uh, and so, so if you could share uh, what you have um, said about this over the years, uh, but then I'd also love it if you could, uh, you mentioned uh, January 6th and what we've seen over the last several years, um, how, if at all, uh, your view on this has changed um, as um, more and more uh, decades have passed since uh, the Brown decision. Uh, on the first point, um, the Supreme Court doesn't have the power to simply decree a new set of arrangements and expect society to follow. Um, lots of court decisions that have intervened in very important ways on social issues have been uh, resisted quite fiercely and sometimes pretty much nullified. So starting back in the 19th century, uh, Prigg versus Pennsylvania, which um, struck down Northern personal liberty laws produced a backlash in Northern legislatures, especially in the 1850s. Uh, Dred Scott produced a massive backlash within the Republican Party. The court essentially declared the Republican Party unconstitutional. Uh, Republicans don't roll over and play dead, rather they mobilize in opposition to the court decision. Um, this is the same thing as Jeff mentioned that Roe versus Wade uh, incites um, the mobilization of Christian conservatives into politics in a way that they had not previously, or at least not recently participated. Uh, Furman versus Georgia mobilized support for the death penalty after it looked as if the court was going to strike down capital punishment. So it's not surprising that this would happen. The court doesn't have its own enforcement arm. It's reliant on the president. And as Jeff said, Eisenhower did not display a lot of support for Brown. Privately, he was quite critical and publicly he refused to endorse the decision. Um, I, so I don't find it surprising that Brown would produce this, this sort of effect in the white South. And indeed the justices knew this, Justice Black predicted this, even though he was willing to go along. President Eisenhower predicted this. One of the reasons he was critical of Brown was that he thought it would destroy Southern moderation. And that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, developments politically in the last decade uh, have reinforced my view that American history often works in a pendulum-like fashion. Uh, President Obama's election, which many of us thought and hoped would signify a new era of post-racism, post-white supremacy, pretty clearly inspired a rightward, rightward shift in the white working class that led to President Trump being able to win the Republican nomination in 2016 on a platform that was pretty close to openly racist. Um, and now we're seeing a backlash against that. So just as Brown produced a backlash that produced a counter backlash, right? Brown brought out the violence at the core of white supremacy, which when laid bare on national television repulsed Northerners, Trump has repulsed uh, 81 million Americans who turned out to vote against him in record numbers and is going to lead to dramatic changes in the racial policies of the national government and hopefully uh, launch a new era of progressive politics. Um, it's hugely ironic, maybe not completely surprising that politics would often work that way. The goal of politics is to get the, your opponents to overplay their hand and that happens and um, things swing back and forth. That's kind of the same story that produced the Civil War in, in the 1860s. Um, so no, I, I think what's happened in the last uh, decade in politics reinforces my view about uh, backlash dyna dynamics and the pendulum swing in American politics. 
Um, Professor Stone, uh, you, you identified yourself as a fan of the Warren Court and um, lauded it, and, uh, um, but, but I would ask you to uh, engage with uh, the same type of question, though, uh, to the um, extent that uh, I was trying to highlight, and I'll be more explicit, uh, that in the 20-year period uh, that our panel um, is pinpointing uh, the African-American school children who were the plaintiffs um, in these cases uh, did not um, enjoy any of the benefits from being the named plaintiffs, none of the remedies inured to their benefit. And I am identifying myself um, as someone who's definitely not old enough to have been around then. Uh, so it's taking until the 70s and the 80s. Um, and when someone like our now Vice President Kamala Harris says, I was that little girl, I'm identifying myself as that little girl more to make the point of which set of African-Americans actually um, were the first truly to benefit from Brown. And I don't know that um, aside from those of us who are um, who spent quite a bit of time delving very deeply into that, I think that is a pretty counterintuitive historical reality uh, that um, these people you are seeing in the black and white photos and who um, were subjected to uh, the mobs uh, that surely Eisenhower did um, reinforce um, and send reinforcements quite literally for a federalist concern, right? He did not want mob rule and he made sure the white folks who were against uh, segregation understood he was the commander in chief. But as you've both noted, um, there wasn't a willingness from the executive branch and really not even the legislative branch to put teeth um, until quite some time later. So those of us who are African-American and got, as I said, through that, that door, um, it is um, striking to me how late that door opened and then also striking how uh, short a time period it stayed open. So um, I, I think it is mo very possible to still be a fan of the Warren Court. I certainly am myself, but, but I'd love to hear how you um, respond to um, what has been a longstanding um, thesis um, and perspective of Professor Klarman. Um, well, uh, I, I would say that um, I assume that the justices of the Warren Court were not naive. I think they understood that they were opening a door to what was going to be a very difficult challenge. I don't know if they anticipated how bad it was going to be. Um, probably not, frankly, but I'm quite sure they understood that this was not going to be, okay, now we decided Brown and we'll have integrated schools within a week. Um, they did know there would be a serious and, and maybe violent opposition to this. So I, I think they were taking a long view and they would have loved it if um, Brown had been able to be implemented uh, relatively quickly, the way some Supreme Court decisions are. Um, but I think they were not naive about that. And my guess is if you had asked Warren, for example, this question, um, he would have said, I understand this is going to be a challenge. I don't think he would have predicted it was as bad as it, as it became. Um, but I think he would say, we're doing the right thing for the long run. And doing this today will make this a better world in the future. And I actually think that, that we are a much better society because of Brown, even though we paid a price to get to where we are. We're a long way from being perfect, obviously. Um, but I think Brown clearly made us a better society. If Brown hadn't been decided, it's unlikely that we would have had the civil rights movement in the same way that we did, um, because some of that was triggered by the violence about Brown. And um, so I guess I, I would say that, that you know, it's clear that the, 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 the students who had the courage to come forward did not get what they were seeking. Um, but that's true, you know, with abortion. I mean, you know, you, the, the women who bring the lawsuits about abortion back in the 1960s and 70s um, generally didn't get abortions um, for different reasons, but nonetheless didn't actually get the abortions. Um, and I, I guess I would say they were the, the, the students who wanted this and the parents who wanted this um, did not get what they immediately wanted, but they got what they ultimately wanted. And they were heroes for doing it. Um, so I, mean, I think Brown made this a much better society, ultimately. And I think that the people who had the courage to pursue these rights were, as I said, heroes and deserve enormous credit. 
Um, and I don't know what the world would be today if Brown had not been decided. Would we still have racially segregated schools? Um, would we have had federal legislation that held them uh, illegal? I don't know. It's not 100% obvious to me, even now, that we would have gotten to that point in history. Um, probably we would have, but we, I don't know that. So I think Brown was, when all is said and done, a victory for civil rights and for the rights of equality in our, in our country, and a, a victory for the rights of those children who put themselves forward because they really are heroes and they did help change our society in fundamental ways. Well, well thanks for that. I, I also want to ask to the topic that is the topic of uh, the, the, the conference writ large, uh, we've, we've spent the morning uh, having individuals um, who are preeminent experts in uh, the interrogation of what the Equal Protection Clause, but the 14th Amendment writ large, both should mean in a, in a, in a literal sense, if you are the interpreter, which is what the court is, the, the binding interpreter that is, uh, but, but also an engagement with what its original purposes are and the incorrectness of Plessy should go without saying, that's why I was mentioning uh, Charles Black and um, his, his various references in uh, a law review article that quite frankly, in my view, never got the same kind of attention that Herbert Weschler's critique of Brown <laughs> long has. And so it is still to me in 2021, um, valuable to hear your thoughts, Professor Stone, on the substance of it. Because if Plessy was wrong from the very moment it was decided, um, as I, I got a question um, through, the, through, the, through the chat that um, was, was raising that point, and I think it's a good one, um, what does that ultimately say, not about uh, the, the ultimate morality of Brown, um, and, and there is a, a lot of rhetorical observation that Brown is correctly decided, but with respect to the substance of what does the Equal Protection Clause mean and what does the 14th Amendment mean and what is the way forward if the way forward is designed to, uh, to, to, to look to how we, as those who are studying the court and thinking about what kinds of legal arguments can be made going forward, um, what is there to be done with equal protection doctrine from this 20 year period? Um, does, does it have any potential for the way forward? I'm very curious as to what you think on that. Well, you know, first of all, when you say Plessy was clearly wrongly decided, from where we sit today, that seems clearly correct. But if you were an originalist and a strict originalist, then Plessy would be a hard decision because one can't say, as Michael noted, that the framers of the 14th Amendment affirmatively understood that racial segregation was unconstitutional. That would be a very hard case to make historically, frankly. And if you believe that that's the right way to interpret the constitution as probably six of our nine current justices do, then they, if they were judges back at the time of Plessy, it's not clear what they would have done, frankly. Um, and even originalists today struggle with Brown because they don't, they don't want to admit that Brown was quote wrong because it was not originalist, but they also can't very well say that the Brown was wrong. But the truth is, I think that, that Brown is a great example of how one should interpret the constitution and how one should approach that, that responsibility. And it's a great example of why originalism in the narrow way that people like Bork and Scalia and some of the current justices understand it is idiotic. Um, because I would say the right way to interpret the Equal Protection Clause and other provisions of the Constitution as well is to think of them as aspirational. And that's how I, that's how I think the framers thought of them. When they said Congress shall make no law or bridge in the freedom of speech or of the press, or that no state shall deny any person equal protection of the laws, um, they had some sense of what they might have meant at the time, but they didn't necessarily know or want to dictate what that would mean a century or two later. And they were, for the most part, people who were fairly smart and thoughtful, and they understood they were putting in 12 words or 14 words, whatever it is, something that did not have a concrete specific meaning. So, so I think that, that Brown was right. Um, and when I teach the, cap, the, court, the, the case, particularly in the last 15 years or so, um, I use it as an example of, okay, what do you guys think of originalism? Right? If originalism would force you into the decision that Plessy was right and that Brown was wrong, 
can you really accept originalism as a legitimate pr approach to constitutional interpretation? Um, and, you know, this is one of the, the real problems that originalists have. So my view is the way to think about Brown is, and, it, and about the Equal Protection Clause is that its fundamental aspiration was to create equality in our country. And I think that the best way to think of it in this respect is the way the Warren Court did, which is basically to say, are there groups in society who are the other and who are not going to be treated equally and fairly and with, in an even-handed way by the majority? And in those are situations where it's, it's essential for courts to step in and to protect their interests um, because democracy is not perfect. And Madison and Jefferson understood this. I mean, they talked about this at the time, that democracy is good, but it's not perfect. And the two biggest weaknesses of democracy is that majorities are not very good about being fair to the other. And the second is they're not very good at um, thinking about the political process in a fair and even, even minded way. And those are the two areas where courts need to be most aggressive. And that, those are the two areas where the Warren Court was most aggressive. So, so my view is they did take the right approach in Brown, absolutely. Um, and it turned out to be a winner. It was not easy to get there. And I don't know what society would look like today if the court had reaffirmed Plessy in Brown, but I don't think it would be as good a society as it is today. Well, I, I, that that um, is, is certainly something that is often taught in the context of Brown. And, and I think a, 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 a re recurring theme that uh, Plessy was inevitable, um, but it doesn't fit as well in my view with how, how the morning has played out, right? The, the morning has, if you look at not just specific intent originalism, which is I think the easier kind of originalism to dismiss, which would be, can we get in the head of the people who wrote the words and you know get in a time machine, go ask them the question, hey, um, would you approve or disapprove of Jim Crow segregation? I think that's why the new originalists and the new new originalists have let that go the way of um, Robert Bork and, and arguably even his, um, his, his chances of being on the Supreme Court. So that's a bit of a straw man, but if we even, used, and I think, um, again, pr Professor Fawner, uh, as the historian would say, none of us lawyers should be going about trying to find one fixed meaning. So I think that may be the, the easier way to, to criticize the originalists. But, but Plessy itself um, has so many problems uh, with both its internal inconsistency, uh, but uh, the, the fact that it is hinging on um, just absolute falsities, that uh, Jim Crow segregation um, isn't meant to shame, harm, and denigrate, um, and that's all being put, um, uh, that is all in the minds of the people who are um, being put into a caste system. Uh, I guess the, the opportunity to um, engage with how wrong Plessy has to be in the substance of based on what people have told us this morning and what we've engaged with, that if we look to not the specific intent of those who wrote the words, but instead an inquiry into what was the purpose of the 14th Amendment writ large, it feels like uh, what, this, the, what we've been brought together here to hear this morning is that the purpose is far clearer. And when we have Eric Foner, <laughs> the quintessential expert, the one who's saying we've in, maybe endured, and that's what I was trying to allude to, I, I knew and study pseudoscience, but I'm coming increasingly willing to say I was also subject to a form of a pseudo history about reconstruction. And is that potentially a way to, to shift the way we both think about Plessy and its inevitability? Because it can't be inevitable to all white men of the time when we have Harlan himself dissenting in the moment. And um, Harlan is someone who had dissented so vehemently and had a very specific theory in the civil rights cases. Um, I, I'm curious I'm, to both you and I'll, I'll go back to Professor Stone first, but I wanna in, um, in, engage uh, Professor Klarman too. Um, is, is that not a potential intellectual way forward to, to, to delve much more deeply into the reasons behind Harlan's dissents in both the civil rights cases and in Plessy instead of just moving past Plessy because granted it's quite unpleasant, but th I think there's plenty to delve into substantively there potentially, but what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I, I didn't mean to suggest that Plessy was right or that I would have decided it that way. All I was saying is that viewed in the times, I don't know enough about the culture of the moment um, to understand what the response to Plessy would have been if it had come out the other way. 
Um, justices do care about that. Justices do worry not only about the right result, but about what are the consequences of the right result. And they often, of course, you know, temper their decisions and, and spread them out over a long period of time and, and so on. Um, what, what I don't know enough about, because I'm not a historian, is what the justices in Plessy would have thought about what would have happened had they decided the case like Brown. And I don't know what would have happened had they done that. Um, and would the, would the society have been able to deal with that? Um, would it have been much worse than what happened um, after Brown or, or not as bad? I don't know the answer to that. But, but, I, but I don't know, A, whether the justices themselves in Plessy believed this was the right result, period, based on however they were interpreting the Constitution, writing a not very convincing opinion, um, or whether they personally did not think this was a desirable or a right result, but that in the circumstances, it was the best they could do. Think about um, Korematsu, right? I mean, Korematsu is a disastrous decision, um, but the justices who reached it, I suspect at the moment they reached it, thought that external factors made it the necessary decision. And it doesn't make it right, it doesn't make it courageous, but if you're trying to simply understand what's going on, Right? Are the justices actually acting out of a sincere legal theory that they believe in, or are they acting out of the constraints upon them based upon what they think are the best interests of the court as an institution and the best interests of the nation in terms of what the consequences of decision would be? So I, I just don't know enough about the internal workings uh, of, and, 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 and views of the justices in place in Plessy. And the very fact is, as Michael has pointed out, that the Warren Court, or the pre-Warren Court, I should say, was as divided as it was before Earl Warren replaced Vincent, is revealing in terms of how both uncertain they were about what the quote, right result was, and also about how nervous they must have been about what the consequences would be both for the Supreme Court and for the nation. So, um, you know, I do think it's important to recognize that justices are often affected by those types of factors. And um, that often explains some, the, some decisions, which may not be the right decisions in, the, in theory, but which in their view, at least, might have been the right decisions in the circumstances of the moment. And again, Korematsu is another terrible decision that I think can be explained only on that ground. Um, Prof Professor Klarman, and I also, we have only about, uh, we have our 15 minutes left, so um, I'd, I'd love to get questions uh, if folks have them, and I have um, one question um, directly that I'm going to put to you, um, but Professor Klarman, if, if you have any responses or thoughts in, in, re in reaction to what Professor Stone has said about the historical context, even around Plessy. I do. Um, I'll try to keep this to two or three minutes, so we have uh, 10 minutes for other questions. Um, so I, I agree with the way Jeff thinks about this, which is to separate the judge's inclination from their capacity. That is, um, were they inclined to strike down segregation but didn't think they could get away with it? And the answer, um, I'm pretty clear from the work I did when I was writing my Jim Crow book, is that they had no inclination to strike down segregation. But even if they did have the inclination, they wouldn't have had the capacity to make it stick. If you struck down segregation laws in the South in the 1890s, black people would have simply been thrown off the train or killed. This is the peak era of lynching. And it's not as if whites in the South were going to accept integration regardless of what the Supreme Court said. Uh, I don't agree that Plessy is obviously wrong as a legal decision. If we're looking at things like text, original understanding and precedent, I actually think Plessy is probably um, at least as right as not on legal grounds. It's obviously morally reprehensible from our perspective today. This ties in with something else when, when Jeff, um, mostly I'm in agreement with Jeff, but when he defends Brown, it's mostly on the grounds that it's obviously a morally right decision. And I would be curious how we limit that sort of methodology when we have six justices who are now among the most conservative in the last hundred years if it was right for the court to invoke what seemed more obviously right morally, then why is it not right for these justices to say, well, I believe in colorblindness, so affirmative action is unconstitutional. I believe that uh, money in politics is speech and it's a good thing, so I'll strike down all campaign finance regulation. I think that's the problem. If you wanna defend Brown and simply generalize this approach to constitutional interpretation, which is that they should do the right thing. 
it doesn't give you much ground for criticizing a right wing court. And that ties into the, the last thing I think I'll say when you ask the question about the way forward. I think it's a mistake to think the way forward is by looking into the past and looking at Harlan dissents or looking at the original understanding of the 14th Amendment. Um, two things about the way forward. One is, I think, and this is a criticism, I think, of, of Jeff's position about the Warren Court. I think liberals in the 1960s became too fond of the judiciary and the idea that judges would protect rights. And I think one thing we learned, um, maybe largely because of Roe, is that having a win in the Supreme Court does not mean a long-term victory and that political mobilization is a more important uh, way to secure rights than simply winning a victory in court. And I do think to win in court often disincentivizes people from staying motivated. So um, the best way, yeah, so that, that's one point is I, I'm not looking for the court to produce racial nirvana. I would be actually happy if today's court would just leave things alone that democracy has produced. And the concern is that this most conservative court in the last hundred years will strike down every democratic reform initiative that the Biden administration might undertake, including efforts to fix racial inequalities on the ground that it violates the colorblind interpretation of the 14th Amendment. So my position would be, you know, Democrats are entitled to control the Supreme Court. Mitch McConnell stole a seat on the court. Uh, Democrats have won seven of the last eight presidential elections. They're entitled to control the court. And I would just want a liberal majority on the court not to chart new directions, but just to leave politics alone rather than strike down gun control, strike down voting rights legislation, strike down efforts to produce racial equity, strike down efforts to expand health care. So um, a mistake to expect the court to produce liberal or racial nirvana. Um, I would be pretty happy if the court would just leave things alone. I don't expect the six conservative justices who dominate the court today to be willing to do that unless Democrats threaten them with the idea of court expansion. Uh, that actually ties in, this is the last thing I'll say, that ties into where we would be without Brown. Um, and I, my guess is, you know, lots of other countries have done away with pretty awful racial past without a Supreme Court decision leading the way. Um, South, South Africa has done away with apartheid. It wasn't easy to do, but they didn't do it because of a court decision. Great Britain has undone a lot of its racist past without a court decision. I, I don't deny that Brown affected the way racial change came in the United States, but the idea that we would not have had a racial revolution without Brown, I think is implausible. And I don't take Jeff to be saying that. It just, he's saying it's hard to know exactly how things would have played out. Um, that, that, that seems right to me. It's super, and shorthand can always be uh, dangerous. So um, we may have to agree to disagree, but uh, to be clear, I think the invitation that um, I was trying to take up is the one uh, that, uh, when I say go back to um, Harlan's dissents, uh, that is a, a specific invitation to um, interpretations of uh, the, the Congress's power under the 13th Amendment, uh, what Professor Amar mentioned with respect to Cong um, Harlan's very robust interpretation of the citizenship clause, um, I, I think uh, that is a, a, an invitation that, again, we can all have, have different views on whether it's a useful one, uh, but uh, the, the, what is the, the, the doctrinal interpretation of the 14th Amendment going forward uh, to the extent that there are new originalists and new, new originalists, they have made it uh, their life's work uh, to invite um, a reevaluation of the meaning of the privileges or immunities clause, for instance, and what I heard Heard this morning, um, and we know that we have amongst us uh, scholars who've been making similar invitations. And um, and for this two uh, two decade period, we're, we're kind of in a, a different way of thinking about it typically. Um, so I have a, a great uh, question, and I'm going to not paraphrase it, but um, read it. Uh, and um, it, the, I'm going to tell you in advance, um, and I'll, it'll be an invitation to either of you to respond. Uh, the question part is going to be thoughts. Uh, so um, so there's not a, a big question. It's more um, I'm going to read you. Uh, 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 some analysis and then uh, get your reaction. Uh, so, um, so, and you might even be able to figure out who it came from, but I'm not going to identify. Uh, so one could read the court's educational jurisprudence in 1954 to 74 through a regional lens. It was remarkable not um, 
Earl Warren, but Warren Berger, remarkably, Earl Warren, but not Warren, but Warren Berger, who arguably wrote the most thoroughgoing school desegregation decree in Charlotte Mecklenburg, which accelerated school de Southern school desegregation. Yet as the litigation shifted to the Northern metropolitan areas like Detroit, the court shifted dramatically to create equal protection clause jurisprudence that foreclosed um, Milliken in Detroit further desegregation in much of the Northeast and Midwest. And so that's part of the historical context you've um, both uh, described and illuminated. And so did uh, Dean Chemerinsky this morning. Um, so in a sense, one might observe that as during reconstruction itself, the court needed a sturdy national source of political support to implement a regime of enlarging racial equality. Once the desegregation challenges emerged in the regions of the country that had largely supported Southern school desegregation, the court tamed its jurisprudence. Uh, thoughts, so, so, so thoughts. Um, I don't know who of you would go first, but- I'll take a shot at it. Um, Great. I, I, think, I think part of what that was about was the notion, and Berger certainly took this position, that laws that have a disparate impact are different from laws that are intended to be discriminatory. And I think his view and his colleagues' views uh, in Milliken and beyond were that in the South, the racial segregation was intended. That was the purpose. In the North, the argument was that there was residential segregation, but it was much more difficult to prove in as straightforward a way that that was the result of an intent to create school segregation. And Berger did not want to go into that very complicated and ambiguous area of how do you know when something was actually intended for racist reasons, as opposed to the racist effects being incidental to whatever was causing it to happen. So I think part of it was that, was that Berger was trying to cabin the issue of desegregation to those circumstances where it was a remedy for explicit intentional racial segregation. And he didn't want to get into the much messier question of does every school have to be equally racially disparate, um, regardless of where people live. And I, I think that was it. He, he saw it as a practical issue. Great. Do, do you have any um, thoughts, Professor Klarman? We're also at the, we have about three minutes left at most. So it also could be an opportunity for some closing thoughts on uh, your part. Uh, quickly in response to the question, I don't think it's clear in 1954 that any of the justices were thinking about the effect of their decision on the South. They were striking down de jure segregation, state laws that assigned black kids to one school and whites to another school. All Northern states had actually prohibited that practice by law, although there were constant subterfuges so that they were doing it just below the surface. If you look at all the internal conference notes and memos, it's not entirely clear that any of the justices thought that what they were doing uh, would have an impact on the North. The NAACP started bringing cases in places long, like Long Island uh, in the early 1960s, and that immediately started producing a backlash. So uh, people may remember or have read that George Wallace uh, took his racism North in 1964. He competed in Democratic primaries in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Maryland, and he won between 30 and 45% of the vote. Um, on Long Island, uh, white uh, working class, often Catholics, were already voting for Barry Goldwater in 1964 before Richard Nixon implemented a Southern strategy. Um, so what happened in Milliken is a reflection of the Republican Party's Southern strategy, which starts with Goldwater, who runs a campaign against the 1964 Civil Rights Act and wins the vote in five deep South states. He wins something like 98% of the white vote in Mississippi. Nixon's elected in 1968 on some combination of being tough on crime and arguing for slowing down school desegregation. He appoints four justices in his first term and the majority in Milliken is five to four with four Nixon appointees and, and Justice Stewart, a holdover uh, and Eisenhower appointee. Right, this is just the politics of race. And if you'd had the Warren court continuing into this time, then the decision would have come out differently. Whether the Warren court could have made it stick, whether they really could have enforced desegregation on a Northern population that was not 
really very supportive is another question. Remember Joe Biden, who was supposed to be a liberal from Delaware in the mid-1970s, was supporting a constitutional amendment to limit busing and uh, making nice with Southern segregationists like uh, Strom Thurmond and James Eastland. Um, it's not a real, real uh, happy reflection on the country, but maybe there was a national consensus to end the Southern system of formal Jim Crow, but there was never a national consensus to produce genuine racial equality. We're probably closer to that as a national consensus today than we've ever been, but we just had 74 million Americans vote for a pretty openly racist presidential candidate. So it would suggest we're still a ways um, from producing any deep consensus to that effect. And, and that certainly uh, refl is reflected in the equal protection jurisprudence as well, uh, that uh, uh, the Washington versus Davis Feeney line of cases, uh, which is, I think, uh, where the, pan the, the conference itself is heading. Um, I don't know if we, um, I think, are we at time or do we have, okay, we're at time. So thank you both very much. Uh, really thank you, a pleasure. Thank you.